This plenary on innovative financing for urban renewables is being moderated by Brock Carlton, who is the CEO of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And so, Brock, please come up to the stage. Having a great lunch. I certainly uh, found this morning and last night really, really interesting. And welcome to the panel on innovative financing for renewable and urban renewables. Just to, to start with, I'd like to just say that, uh, as, as Michael said, I'm the CEO of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. FCM is the voice of municipal government in Canada. We, represent, we have 2,000 municipal rep members. We represent 90% of the Canadian population. And we really do two things. We work on policy and develop policy that's related to the priorities for municipal government. And we use that policy work to drive a government relations and advocacy work that speaks to Canadians. We hope that it generates di dialogue in the country about the importance of municipal government, ultimately influencing federal policies and programs. We also run programs that build capacity for municipal government because we believe it's really important that municipalities have the ability to deliver the kinds of services that citizens expect. Most notable in those programs is our Green Municipal Fund. It's a half billion dollar endowment fund where we provide grants and loans to municipalities for environmental initiatives. You heard this morning about the deep water cooling system in Toronto. Well, FCM's Green Municipal Fund actually provided some of the original financing for some of the early feasibility and engineering studies so that that project could be deemed viable. The city could make the decision and get on with that piece of really important work. All the things that we do at FCM comes down to one belief, that city building is nation building. We believe that if this country is going to be economically viable, environmentally sustainable, and socially cohesive, municipal government has to be at the table with the provinces and territories and the federal government. This is going to make Canada strong. Now, this notion of, of nation building plays out in many different play, ways and different levels. In the, the, the world that I circulate in, we're talking at the federal government level with senior federal decision makers. But nation building also takes place in every corner of this country and all the work that you're doing in your communities, in your institutions, is building this country and making it a better place for Canadians to live. I was uh, at breakfast this morning talking to Nancy Myers, and in like one minute elevator speech on her career, I was thinking, wow. Like, she does real stuff that is delivering real results in communities, right? And all of you in, around this room, listening to the examples this morning, have the same kinds of stories about real, real things happening in communities. This panel is also about a reality. It's about a reality of finding innovative ways to finance important projects in our communities. Before we get to the panel, I just would like to paint a, a picture of the fiscal reality of municipal government so it gets a bit of context for the conversations that you're going to have over the next little while. If you look at the re revenue generating uh, capacity of municipal government, 50% of municipal revenues in Canada come from the property tax. That's one of the largest percentages, reliance on property tax in the OECD. 20% comes from user fees and 20% comes from transfers from the provinces and territories and the remaining 10% comes from just kind of miscellaneous sources. This regime, this re revenue regime has been in place for decades and decades, but we all know that the pressures on municipal government, the changes required for municipal government are really significant and much have really outgrown the fiscal framework that municipalities operate in. The second thing that's important to know is that since 2007, the municipal net fiscal liability has been on the rise. Municipalities have had to borrow, have had to increase their debt to finance the kinds of projects, some of the things that we're talking about, are the ideas that are being talked about here, those big projects that deliver, so that municipalities can deliver the kinds of services that is needed. So the bad news is that there's this fiscal framework that is really constraining the opportunities for transformative work at the community level. The good news is that there's some really creative stuff going on, some really innovative examples of where use of non-public money in particular to drive a sustainability agenda and drive the transformations that's needed in our communities. And that is what this panel is about. So I'm going to just move on now to this panel because we really want to hear from folks who have, an important, who have important stories to tell. Our first speaker will be Ken Nolan. 
Ken is, uh, Ken is uh, manager of Power Resources, City Electric in Burlington, Vermont. Ken will be followed by Ross Beatty, executive chairman of Altera Power Corporation. Then Karen Lockridge, a principal from Mercer in Toronto, will speak. And then finally, Matt Zipchin, general manager, Solar Share Trek Renewable Energy Cooperative. Each of these speakers will have six minutes. I watched Marin Smith this morning. I got a little bit of training about how to do this and keep things on time. Then following those, uh, those speeches, those presentations, we'll have a Q&A until the session closes. So ladies and gentlemen, let's just get on with the panel and we'll ask Ken to, to come to the podium and make his comments. Good afternoon, I am Ken Nolan from Burlington Electric in Vermont. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Burlington is located in northern New England, about halfway between Boston and Montreal. Um, I work uh, power resources for the uh, municipal utility there. Um, we are a, a subdivision of the city, so we, we actually operated the utility, but uh, we report to the mayor. Just to put some context here, uh, Burlington is Vermont's largest city, and when I say largest, um, we're 40,000 people. The state as a whole is about 600,000 people, so we're pretty small scale. We've been talking for the last day, day and a half, uh, really at a national and global level, and I'm going to bring you down to very concrete, specific application of the concepts we've been talking about. Um, we're, we happen to be home to the, the state university uh, and to the largest hospital in the region. But even then, we're, we have 20,000 electric customers, about 350,000 megawatt hours we serve a year, 65 megawatt peak. So think about a tenth of Vancouver or smaller. The, the one advantage we really have uh, is the population in Burlington is very uh, active, very progressive, and they're engaged on energy, energy issues uh, pretty substantially. We, we have a, a very active community uh, outreach. They have neighborhood assemblies that are constantly talking about energy issues. Uh, last fall, and the reason I was asked to come here, um, last September we bought a seven megawatt hydro plant, which resulted in us uh, reaching the point of being 100% uh, sourced by renewable energy for our electric supply. Right. Thank you. So I want to get, tell you a little bit about the story. Um, this is the innovative finance panel, but in all honesty, when I started trying to detail what we did innovative, I, we don't think of what we did as very innovative on the financing front. Uh, we use very traditional techniques. For a utility, uh, we issued municipal bonds to procure some of our resources. We actually own a 50 megawatt biomass plant, and we own the hydro plant I mentioned, uh, and those bonds were issued with greater than 80% public support. Uh, we have to have a vote anytime we issue debt and uh, the, the residents of the community came out and supported every, every decision we've asked them to make. We also were able to leverage uh, the, some of the bonds reserve funds. So we, we built a biomass plant in the 1980s. And those bonds recently got paid off and there's about $10 million of reserve funds that were attached to that that got freed up. We actually used those funds to buy the, the hydro plant. So we were able to roll some of that investment we'd made in the past forward. We, we also in, uh, used pretty liberally uh, power purchase agreements. So leveraging private partner, uh, public private partnerships using the tax incentives the private developers can get, uh, with our being willing to back the financing through a, a contract. Um, and we did that through varying five, 20, 25 year contracts, whatever the developers really needed to make the projects work. Most of those were for fixed price. So the developer knew they were gonna get a dollar, a certain dollar per megawatt hour. We knew we were gonna spend a certain level of, of money uh, on the energy we were buying. Vermont also is very aggressive on uh, net metering legislation. We have uh, incentive tariffs. I was talking to someone last night um, we end up having to pay through state legislation 20 cents a kilowatt hour for every kilowatt hour solar project generates. Uh, to put that in context, Vermont's retail rates are roughly about 15 cents a kilowatt hour on average. So we're paying an additional five cents ab above what we're getting for revenues for anyone who puts on a solar panel on their, on their house or business. 
that's really spurred the development in the, in the state and in the city in particular. If I, if I had to point to one thing that I would consider innovative in the way we did this, um, I talk about commodities markets, which is not something a municipal utility or a municipality typically deals with. Uh, but in New England, we have very robust renewable por portfolio standards in pretty much every state. Uh, Vermont's the last holdout. We don't have a standard in Vermont. Uh, they're actually voting on it today in our legislature uh, to make us the sixth state to, to have that legislation. But because we were investing, uh, signing contracts or owning renewable projects, we were able to sell credits from that into, into the other markets. Um, in other states. We actually use that to buy down the cost of the renewability. So <clears throat> we have a very active commodities group in a small municipal utility that is using the financial markets to keep the cost low for our uh, residents. So when I look at it, the real change that, that came about to drive Burlington to this green, uh, green future was a few changes in perspective. It wasn't anything fin financing sign we did different. We realized early on, about 20 years ago, that efficiency is a supply resource. It's, if we can make uh, people use less for less cost than going out and buying the energy from a generating plant, that's a good thing for us. We built momentum with small victories. We bought small contracts. We signed small contracts. So the, from the city leadership perspective, they were never making a decision on a huge investment. It was all small investments and one step after another that they could get behind. We leveraged the tax incentive uh, that the private developers brought. We often found it was cheaper for us to let them take the tax incentive than it was to issue municipal debt, which in the US is tax exempt. Um, and it was still cheaper to use the private industry to do that. And we looked at the true cost of uh, the various fuel types, um, both from an intermittent and from a risk standpoint. When you're buying natural gas or coal, there's, here, uh, last night we heard that natural gas is very cheap in Vancouver. We had cheap gas too until uh, Storm Katrina hit New Orleans. And now all of a sudden we had prices that went up 20 and 30 times. So we, we started looking at the, our investments from a risk perspective. We were managing the risk, not the cost, and looking over the full 25 years life that we expected these contracts to have. And you get different answers when, when you start to look that way. Things that look like they're too expensive now actually start to make sense when you're looking at how, what the worst case risk if things really become troublesome turns out to be. I'm gonna end with just a couple of, of slides here that show the impact we've had. So on energy efficiency, that's our first choice. We have six people in our utility that are dedicated to nothing other than helping uh, residents and businesses become more efficient. We fund that through an adder onto our, our electric rates. Um, and we use less energy today than we did in 1989 as a city, even though our economy has grown about 30%. And from a re renewable standpoint, I'm here to tell you renewables can actually reduce your costs. Um, the blue line in the chart is what our actual gross power costs are. The green line is our net cost after we deal with the financial markets and the re renewable energy credits. What I'm trying to show you here is our actual cost of electricity from a wholesale standpoint has dropped 40% since 2009 while we went to 100% renewability. And we're now using that $10 million a year to reinvest into solar and battery storage and greater efficiencies and trying to drive the curve even further. Leave it there, thank you. Great, thanks very, thanks very much, Ken. It's such a, an interesting uh, statement of wisdom, breaking big things down into man manageable decisions so that uh, the big ideas can eventually be realized. Our next speaker is Ross Beatty. Thank you. Thank you very much, good afternoon. Um, so I'm the token business guy here. Um, uh, very much feeling like we are in an energy revolution and uh, very much also that I'm like the frontline shock trooper, trying to make it happen and make money at the same time, which is, uh, which is a very different, there's two different concepts. Um, so, so I run Altera Power Corp. I'm the largest shareholder, the founder of the company, 
I'll just give you a little quick walk through, through, uh, through what Altera is today. It's been going for about six or seven years. We started in geothermal, then we went into wind and hydro and solar. So today we, we have operations in all, all four of those, uh, or, or have and have, more or less have. We have currently uh, two very large uh, Run of River hydro projects in British Columbia. We have a wind farm in, uh, in northern British Columbia. Uh, we have two geothermal plants in Iceland. We just sold a geothermal plant in Nevada. And we just sold last year uh, three solar farms that we had built in Ontario. Uh, today, our revenue is about $100 million a year US. We have about $50 million of EBITDA. And uh, these five power plants today generate uh, 1,300 gigawatt hours of electricity. It's about, this, it's about the amount that we're, uh, sort of the city the size of Vancouver needs, um, just the urban part of Vancouver, at least not the, not the sprawl that we have in, in the smaller municipalities around Vancouver. And we have long-term contracts typically for this, for this power. Um, we are in, in the middle of building a couple more plants. We have a 62 megawatt uh, Runner River project that is in the middle of construction right now north of Vancouver near our two existing ones. And we have uh, a large wind farm that we're building down in Texas, a 204 megawatt wind farm. All of our plants we, we have built ourselves and we operate ourselves, so it's a, it's a, it's a solid company and, uh, and we're very proud of our, of our operating uh, team and, and people that, that uh, that we use in this in, the, in our operations. Uh, just on finance, so, uh, so we're not a city finance group, we're, we're a, more or less an a independent power producer. So, you know, there's some lessons here that might apply to cities, but, but generally we're just trying to build ourselves as a big, big uh, independent power company. Uh, today, 550 megawatts. A year from now, we'll be about 840 megawatts, and uh, we expect to be over 1,000 megawatts by sometime in 2018. So we're just trying to build ourselves as big as we can. Every megawatt, you know, our, our fundamental principle is every megawatt we produce is a megawatt you don't have to burn something to produce electricity from. And that's the overriding principle. It's a kind of a real green, green concept, but trying to make money at the same time. This business is all about finance. Uh, so in the last six or seven years, we've raised about $2.5 billion to build these plants. Uh, we work with a lot of partners, uh, ownership interest. Uh, typically, we own and control uh, the operation, but, but we, don't, we don't have 100% of it. We have, we have all kinds of different partners in Iceland, pension funds in British Columbia, uh, private equity, uh, and in, in our wind farm in Texas, we have, we have, uh, we have a, a, a financial partner and some tax equity partners. So we, we do a lot of finance. Uh, we, have, we are right in the middle of about a $700 million financing. We hope to have it closed next week, in fact. It's a very, very busy thing. You can imagine that amount of capital is, is a, is a, it takes a lot of, it takes documentation that would, that would be this high if off the ground. There's 180 different agreements that have to be negotiated with all kinds of different players. Uh, and then we did $300 million last fall, plus $100 million holding company financing. All of this is debt. There's just an enormous amount of capital. One of the, the takeaways today that I, I would like to, to leave is that there is just a huge amount of capital available for renewable energy projects. People, capital providers like the business. It's clean, it's long-term, read forever. It's predictable typically. Even though you have fluctuating wind and fluctuating solar you, over, the, over, the, over a long-term 10 or 20 or 30 years, it smooths out and it's, it really is predictable and that's exactly what providers of capital want. Some of our loans are 40-year loans. So we have a fixed, a fixed interest rate for 40 years, and, and that's because we can deliver reliably and predictably power for the next 40 years, and, and, and you can do financial models that, that predict this. So, um, so, so there's a lot of capital available. Uh, the market likes renewable energy. It's back in the, in the, in the positive side. Uh, finance providers like to have things that are popular, and this is certainly a popular type of power. Uh, there is a revolution happening, and part of that revolution is lots and lots of capital available at very low interest rates. We do have a historic low interest rate market right now that's providing a lot of search for yield for capital uh, pools. So yields of 8 to 10 percent today are far better for, for a lot of sources of capital than you know, the modest returns they can get through keeping money in treasury bills or other forms of, of, uh, of asset. So I noted, for example, Sadhu's comment about, well, we can't possibly, uh, you know, the city of Vancouver can't possibly have four or five billion dollars for, uh, for the biomass projects that, that Chris was talking about, you know, needing to, to make Vancouver 100% uh, uh, renewable based just on biomass, which is technically possible. Well, the c cities don't have to provide this capital. 
Cities, all they have to do is make the policy framework that allows the private sector to go and do these, do these things, provide enough policy that they can actually make money on, on one or another or another of the technologies. There's lots of technology out there today. You've heard a bunch of it. Last night we heard some more. There's lots of technology available. Uh, there's innovation happening all the time. We are really in a revolution right now of energy efficiency and energy, uh, energy uh, forms of, of, of creating electricity, creating energy for transportation. Um, cities have to embrace the fact that these technologies exist. There's lots of people available in the private sector interested in trying to take advantage of them. There's lots of capital available. What they need is a clear policy framework to allow them to do that and to do it quickly because they can do it quickly. Uh, in BC, we have a utility, BC Hydro, that is a very large organization, rather unwieldy. Um, it takes a long time to make things happen. I can, I can tell you for sure that, that the private sector can generate more power, as much power as, as, as BC Hydro quicker and cheaper uh, if we have the right policy framework. There's lots of complexities. There's lots of hurdles. Uh, let, the, let the private sector take those, take those uh, risks, and, and they will deliver. Um, You've seen all the numbers. Renewable energy is competitive against all other forms of power generation. We uh, lost a, a bid in Nevada last year for a solar plant. We bid eight and a half cents a kilowatt hour, and we lost. We bid 10 cents on a big solar project we bid on in Brazil, which would be, had been unheard of just four or five years ago to, 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 to lose on a 10 cent a kilowatt hour bid. Somebody underbid us and is providing electricity now, solar electricity for less than less than 10 cents a kilowatt hour. We can produce wind power now in Texas for less than 5 cents a kilowatt hour. This is, these again are the numbers that were just unheard of a few years ago. So it's exciting for me to be part of that revolution. We're in the trenches, we're, we're working hard, trying to build a big company. The bigger the company, the lower the cost of capital. It's all about finance and that's what makes shareholders uh, uh, good returns. So that's, that's our game and uh, we're just gonna keep at it. Uh, it's really nice to be here, thank you. It's a really important story of the, import, of the critical nature of private sector working together with the public sector in a good policy framework, mobilizing capital to find some of the solutions that we're trying to uh, achieve. Our next speaker is Karen Lockridge. Thanks. Um, so I'm with Mercer. It's a global consulting firm focused on the areas of health, wealth, and careers. Uh, and I'm going to talk about mobilizing uh, investor capital for the clean economy, give an update on some work that Mercer is doing to support institutional investors. Um, so back in 2011, Mercer uh, issued a report, a study on uh, strategic asset allocation and the implications of climate change. I wasn't involved in this study back then, and in fact, uh, climate change, resource scarcity was not at all on my radar screen. I've had a big uh, sort of aha moment since then and uh, have been involved in an update to this study. So this is looking at the investment risks and opportunities related to climate change. This is a collaborative research project with uh, 16 uh, investor partners representing one and a half trillion dollars of assets and uh, a number of advisors on experts on various groups. Uh, Sean Kidney is one of them um, with the Climate Bonds Initiatives providing us uh, input on this uh, study. So uh, it's really focused on how can we support investors in um, making decisions around portfolio implementation. So how did we go about doing this? Uh, first of all, we started with a review of the climate models. So we did this uh, study goes out to 2050. So a review of the latest literature modeling around the mitigation, adaptation, and policy and economic impacts. Uh, and then from that, we identified four scenarios. There's lots of uncertainties going forward, whether it's policy, uh, Im impacts, technology. So I identified four scenarios uh, upon which we would uh, do our modeling. Three are based on different emissions pathways. Uh, so one represents more aggressive, a two degree scenario. Uh, the other extreme, one where emissions actually rise uh, from now out to 2050, and then one in the middle. And then a fourth scenario looking at sensitivity for uh, physical impact, which is uh, important from a damage uh, and economic impact perspective. And then to help uh, translate these scenarios into uh, potential investment implications, we identified four 
uh, risk factors. So these are indicators of risk for um, investors. So we call it the TRIP, trip risk factors, technology, which is really about what this, uh, a lot of what this conference is about, the pace and scale of investments to support uh, the transition to the new economy, uh, the low carbon economy, and then policy. Uh, at the other end, uh, key, as Ross was just saying, we need uh, strong policy support. Uh, and then the two in the middle is, is the physical impact. So whether it's uh, chronic changes in weather, uh, temperature, sea level rise, drought, versus um, more acute extreme weather events that have, can impact uh, values of assets. And then together we take these four scenarios of how the future may unfold, uh, map these to the uh, potential risks, and translate that into potential investment implications so that we can model it for our partners and other uh, investors. So this uh, study, we're going to be launching the final results on uh, June 4th, uh, but just to give you a very high-level preview, uh, not surprising, across all four scenarios, we find uh, meaningful investment impacts, uh, both positive and negative, and the key message is that investors should be uh, prioritizing action over inaction, and of course the uh, graphic there just shows key actions. First and foremost, developing uh, investment beliefs uh, or evolving investment beliefs around how the future may unfold uh, related to climate change and, and uh, translating those beliefs into investment policy, developing processes to support the policy and um, actual implementation and day-to-day -day portfolio decisions. So the report outlines a number of the, the, the what, what, what may happen under these scenarios, uh, the so what, what does this mean, and now what, what can investors do? Um, and for, for those that uh, remain unprepared for change, of course, uh, negative uh, returns can result. So then, in terms of uh, the investor challenge moving forward, um, we talk about uh, a different framework of, or different types of investors, future makers versus future takers. So um, there are, what we might say, uh, investors who are climate unaware future takers, so these are uh, investors who are, if they're ignoring the risks and opportunities related to climate change, uh, certainly it's going to be to the detriment of future long-term returns. Um, and then there's, in the middle, climate-aware future takers. So they recognize the risks and opportunities and reflect that into uh, their portfolio decisions. And then, uh, probably most important, uh, are future-aware uh, or climate-aware future makers. So these are investors that are not only um, building this into their beliefs, processes, and portfolio, but also trying to influence, whether it's through collaboration, uh, calls for policy, action, um, or just visible leadership to uh, influence systemic market-wide outcomes. Um, so since this is a room full of climate-aware future makers, Certainly would be uh, interested in any comments, uh, suggestions, feedback on how we can mobilize institutional investor capital. And we had a good workshop this morning, a number of great ideas already. Um, so thank you. Wow, I didn't even have to do the two minutes. Um, I'm just thinking about this climate aware future makers. I hope that your aha moment that's now put you as a climate aware future makers in retrospect was a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Our final speaker is Matt Zipchin. Thank you everyone for having me. Oh, I guess that's pretty loud here. Uh, so before I tell you about our organization, I'd like to set the stage. Uh, how many of you own your own home? Raise your hand. Congratulations. I'll bet all the money in my right pocket, and I work for a nonprofit, so there's a lot of riding here, um, that before you own your home, when you were a renter, that you didn't really pay that much attention to real estate policy or that you weren't really interested in investing in that rental space. And maybe all you really cared about was how much you were paying for rent. But then actually once you owned your own home, things changed. You cared about it, you invested in it, you cared about the policy. And that's the lesson of ownership and investment that we need to be able to deploy renewable energy. You've heard uh, last night that the German population, 80% of them, support the great energy transition. 
What you may not know is that over the 35 years of investment in Germany, renewable energy, that the largest block of investment didn't come from hedge funds, didn't come from energy companies, didn't come from government. It actually came from individuals, co-ops, and communities. The reason why they're demanding more energy, renewable energy, is because they're investors and owners in it. And that's what we do at TREC. So TREC, Toronto Renewable Energy Co-op, started in 1998. The idea was to incubate renewable energy co-ops as a vehicle for community asset ownership. Uh, they helped put up the first urban wind turbine in Canada, which was a uh, joint venture between Toronto Hydro and Windshare Co-op, which, which was the co-op they incubated. And now we're actually, we've expanded our services. We, act, we offer um, fee-for-service uh, support for other renewable energy co-ops and organizations in social finance, whether that's administrative, member management, social finance, ba social finance back office services. And then we also have a sister charity, Trek Education, where we educate um, a ton of kids from grade five to high school on renewable energy. One of um, our greatest success stories is SolarShare. I'm the general manager of SolarShare. There's our mission. We're one of Canada's leading solar co-ops, and we build solar projects. We lease uh, commercial rooftops or empty fields, install solar panels on them, sell that electricity to the government for 20 years under feed-in tariff contract, but we offer the opportunity of local citizens to then invest in those projects. Uh, we went to market with an offering of five-year, 5% 5 bonds, which in this interest environment is fantastic. And so far, we've built about 30 million in solar projects. We've raised 10 million in solar bonds from about 900 of our members. Uh, recently, since we've actually cracked the RSP uh, nut, which for those who are not from Canada, RSP is like a tax efficient um, savings vehicle through which most Canadians invest. Uh, so since then, we've been featured in the National Post, on CBC, and the Globe and Mail. And we've been getting $100,000 checks in the mail without people even talking to us and being like, I want to invest, I want to align my investment with my values and still have a good return. And so here is our, um, our model. So the highest risk in uh, developing renewable energy projects tends to be in the construction phase. So we have a private pool of capital, which is now uh, called community power capital, so some high net worth individuals uh, who also want to invest according to their, uh, to their mission and values. We use that to build the projects, and then we refinance them using our solar bonds and long-term debt, and then that frees up our capital to build more. And that model is great because it positions our solar bonds as lower risk. It's also how we actually made it RSP eligible. And now we've actually really got to enjoy the, a huge trend in the finance industry, which is called impact investing. So we see institutional investors and foundations looking, again, for returns, but also environmental and social returns. Here are some of the organizations that have invested in us. And then what's next for us? So now that we've proven this model of local ownership and local investment, we're looking to go national. Uh, Canada having our different provincial jurisdictions and regulations, it's a bit of a process. We're also looking at investing in international projects. The feed-in tariff program in Ontario probably only has about two years left in it, at least on the solar side, so we're starting to look abroad. Another area that we're really excited about is energy efficiency, which was talked about a lot today. Uh, again, with the impact investing and crowdfunding model coming together, I think there's a huge opportunity here. You've heard about uh, how solar panels you know, decreased in cost 70%, but really what that did is that made the business case. That didn't make it scalable. What made it scalable was standardized business models, templates, and de-risking uh, procedures to basically bring finance to the table. We see energy efficiency as the next step there. And so we're working, we're again, we're look, looking to formalize community power capital as a place to do the construction financing. And then we're also working with CoPower, which is an online investing platform for the takeout financing, similar to the solar share model. And that's it for me. It's such a great story of start local, build your success local, and then start to, to build outwards and upwards from there. Um, so we're going to go to a period of questions. I think, I think you'd agree that what we've heard is some really interesting stories that talk about the, in generally, about the intersection of technology and finances and policies and relationships to kind of make the transformative kinds of changes that we're looking for in our communities. So we have um, about, a little, I think a little more than 10 minutes, eh? For, we have 10 minutes for questions. 
So, yes, question right here. Hi, uh, my name is Mark. I, I was just wondering, in BC we have the net metering program which uh, pays our people who feed in 10 cents a kilowatt hour, which isn't really enough to make, to, to pay back and, and be able to service debt or pay investors or anything like that. Um, so my question, I guess, would be how, who, who do we lobby at BC Hydro or within the government to try and have that increased? Okay, have, uh, let's have the opposite question and then we'll, we'll uh, hear from the panelists. So, uh, Gil, friend from Palo Alto, a lot, of, a lot of the power purchase agreements we heard from Germany this morning and from you guys are paying premiums for solar on long-term contracts, but the price of solar is dropping very, very rapidly. Is that a good investment of public resources to lock in high prices, uh, which provides an incentive for now, but long-term may not make sense economically? How do we, how do we balance that? Right. I'll, I'll tackle, uh, I'll, I'll start with maybe a little bit for both. So, so who you talk to is, uh, you talk to everybody. You talk to BC Hydro, you talk to your politicians, um, and make the case to, to bump up that, that feed-in tariff or that, uh, that, that, that tariff that they're willing to pay. It, it's, it's not likely to be uh, very sympathetically viewed, I don't think, because uh, BC Hydro doesn't like to do this. It's not, a, it's not a business they really want to be in. But it will get cheaper and cheaper, and if they stick at 10 cents, it will be more commercial over time. Uh, the, the other question is, in the case of Germany, as far as I understand, the Energy, energy Givenda uh, uh, fellow is, is here. He's probably the best qualified answer. But, but the, 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 as I understand it, the, the Germans have provided these, these incentives, and so has Ontario for that matter. Ontario has done the same thing. They've provided a 40 cent per kilowatt hour uh, uh, tariff for, for our solar energy that we've supplied to the, to the grid. Uh, but, the, but then they, they've stopped doing that, and, and they've stopped doing it in Germany. And they're now they're bidding contracts that are, that are asking companies to bid power prices that they can make money at, and it's eight cents a game. It's eight or nine cents. And that means that they have, they have provided that incentive. It's cost the treasury money. It's cost, it's cost utility consumers money. But, but it's just a transition thing. And it's created so much demand for solar that it's brought the cost of the solar installations down, which all of a sudden makes it economic at lower and lower prices, and all of a sudden now they're starting to bid these, these programs, and, and the ultimate result will be lower energy prices for Germans and people in Ontario, especially from solar power. Can I? Yep, sure. Add, uh, yeah. um, it, it's really a matter of what you want for a policy outcome. So, so in Vermont, they started with net metering just on your local home, 20 cents a kilowatt hour, whatever you produce. Then they expanded to group net metering, uh, or what you might call virtual net metering. So I can put a solar panel on my home that's oversized for me, but I can get my neighbors to invest in that. And the utility then has to divvy up the credits amongst the neighbors. So I tell them who's invested in the project, and the utility is responsible for figuring out how to get the credits back. And we've also done a, a version of the, the standard offer feed-in tariff, similar to what Germany did. And we're still tweaking that, because the prices are coming down, and, and we overpaid. But what that's done in Vermont is by paying the high price, we spurred solar development to the exponential curve. And that's actually driven the utilities to redesign themselves. We're, we're in the midst of a, a major overhaul of all utilities in Vermont. So now their utilities are finding that they have to buy into the, the solar market, into the uh, putting in battery storage, or else they're going to have a third party private developer coming in and taking their customers leaving them just with a wires company. And so that discussion was all spurred by having strong net metering and standard offer type tariffs in place. I wouldn't mind following up on the comment too in terms of um, making an investment to, to a higher price energy system. We're not here to you know, invest in our lowest cost energy. We're here to address the climate risk. And that's when often people talk about, okay, what is the lowest price? What's the levelized cost? But really, what's the value of the risk that we're mitigating? And that rarely comes into the conversation. And for in Ontario, at least, you know, our high, in Toronto, our highest load is in the middle of the day, and it's air conditioning. Well, that's when solar panels are producing the most. So it's it, there is some context-specific stuff. And whenever you somebody attacks you on price, attack them on risk. Yeah. Yeah. And all, yeah. Exactly. And part of risk is uncertainty. And and so what is the what is the likelihood that oil prices or or coal prices or gas prices will go much, much higher, say, in 20 or 30 years, because of any one of a number of things. That risk you eliminate when you have a source of energy that's essentially free, other than the capital cost of installing it. Wind, solar, geothermal, and hydro. We've got a second question over here. Jürgen Abergan from Copenhagen. 
Matt, I have a question to you uh, regarding energy efficiency uh, and your financing model to that. Uh, could you explain a little bit more about your handle, uh, the risk related to a lot of, of projects where you have a lot of uncertainties related to the savings? Sure. Um, so this is a new model that we've just kind of started, and it depends on whether you're just talking about a, a large-scale energy efficiency project, so we're talking about maybe about like half a million and greater uh, versus a smaller scale one. On the larger scale, we're looking at the, um, the ESCO model, so a pay as you save. Um, for those uh, policymakers, uh, please check out the Toronto Atmospheric Fund website. Uh, so they've developed a, a really nice energy savings performance contract, and then they actually have Energi, which is an insurance company in the States, uh, insure those. So, so first of all, the engineering company comes in and puts their stamp on the savings. So they're standing behind it. And then the insurance company comes in and insures those savings, and then it's actually been reinsured. So that's for the larger projects. So it, it totally takes the risk away from the building owner. Uh, on the smaller projects, we're still working through some of that model because having that much insurance, there's some cost to that. Uh, and we're looking at some other kind of innovative ways to take away that risk. Any other comments? Okay, we have a question here and then one at the back. Uh, Malcolm Shield, City of Vancouver. A, a very simple question. Could I ask the panel to comment on the divestment movement and the various aspects of it and its impacts on, on how you see financing of these changes? Well, it's been great for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, now that we, it's funny, once you get to a certain size, people believe in your legitimacy. Uh, when we first launched, uh, we were knocking on doors and people took three years to invest in us. They'd talk to us, talk to us again, and uh, now that we're actually a certain size, people are just like, as I said, sending checks in. And a large reason, especially on the foundation side, is the divestment movement. So it's been really good for us. Yeah, I would just echo that. The divestment movement has uh, certainly generated a lot of awareness and dialogue. Um, that said, it is challenging or, you know, it, it's challenging for uh, investors to implement, not necessarily, uh, you know, can it be done? We know it can be done, um, but, uh, you know, they're looking at their risk-adjusted return in total and it's a transition. Uh, so what we encourage investors to do to, you know, take a step back, you know, look portfolio-wide, develop the beliefs, uh, and there's, you know, lots of tools and, and uh, methods and I think this you know this kind of conference is great I certainly came here to learn and I've spoken at a number of divestment uh, forms you know people have asked me to to speak uh, what I think we need more of is the discussions with people you know people like this group around um, understanding how investors can uh, mobilize and I'm talking generally about pension funds you know so these are larger than you know they're focused on large funds, uh, risk-adjusted rate of return, and um, so uh, certainly moving in the right direction, but I think this kind of dialogue is great. It's, uh, you know, I, I understand the divestment movement. It's a, great, it's a great thing, I think. That would be my take, but it's, a, it's, a, it's almost irrelevant in the picture of investing, in the big picture, because there's, there's, there's trillions and trillions of dollars that are going to be invested by investors who just don't care about that kind of stuff. But on a more fundamental basis, uh, with or without the divestment movement, you know, the fossil fuel industry is a dinosaur industry. I mean, let's take coal. Coal companies are going to be almost every coal company, uh, certainly in North America and Europe, will be, will be finished in, the, in, I think, in the, in the foreseeable future, 10 years, 15 years. It's a dinosaur business. It's going out of business for all manner of reasons. Uh, and, and I think everything we've seen today and yes and last night, this, this is a real revolution, and it's a revolution that will bring in renewable energy at the cost of uh, the, 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 the loss of the, the fossil fuel industry. So it's just a bad industry to invest in, whether you believe in divestment or not for, 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 for ethical reasons, it's just a bad industry to invest in. And it will, you know, those companies will decline in, 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 in value. It's, it's, it's already happening to the coal companies. Most of them, a lot of them are bankrupt already. Uh, it's just bound to roll out to the other, the other industry as well. And you've seen the reasons why this is happening today. I think we have our last question back here in the corner. Uh, Vic Derming, Capital Regional District. You know, one of the things, and I think one gentleman mentioned it a bit already, is we're all of us looking at these comparative costs from the terms of cost of production. As soon as you factor in carbon cost, then the whole competitive balance changes. Mm -hmm. And that's where avoided energy and energy efficiency have the lowest carbon costs of all. Uh, and so 
putting in a carbon cost factor to all energy produced would dramatically change the focus of investment, I would think. Totally. Thank you. Any comments? Absolutely. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> we agree. I, I, and the other thing is, I think you, you could put in a, you know, you could put in a societal cost to the fossil fuel industry. You know, the the, the, the harm, the, the health, the safety, all that stuff. That just that's you know, if if it's not already dead because of uh, the carbon cost, it's it's going to be you know, kicked in the in the grave by by the other stuff. That's actually a great example. Um, in Ontario, the impetus behind the feed-in tariff program was health. A lot of the medical industry, uh, so I think it was about 16 or 20 percent of our generation was from coal, and it was really the health industry that got behind the renewable energy movement because of the health costs of coal. Yeah, I, I would add, I don't, it's not just carbon. Uh, what really was a catalyst for us is uh, when Katrina hit the Gulf Coast, New England is about 50 percent of the generation in New England is natural gas, and when that storm hit, within a month, our wholesale price of energy tripled. And anybody who was on the market saw major rate increases coming. So that, that really is what spurred us to start looking differently. And we started evaluating not on the cost today, but how bad could it get if more storms like that hit? And if you start making your investment decisions as a utility on that perspective, mm -hmm. then being able to cap your exposures, uh, as, as Ross said, we now know through the investments we've made that over the next 25 years, our rates can't go up any more than 25% because there's no fuel cost associated with our supply. Uh, other utilities that haven't made that decision are at the whim of the market and, and the whim of the, the weather and whatever else happens. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to just make a final thank you to the panelists and uh, perhaps a round of applause for the presentation.